there is joy in my heart it is flowing like a river i will praise the lord we dance in my heart there is joy everlasting King, we thank you for all that you have done. Praise the Lord. God bless you, choir. Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you are doing in our midst. We thank you for your love towards us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be before you this morning in worship. Father, be thou exalted in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord, we understand that you want us to forgive others just as you have forgiven our sins. You want us to love others just as you have loved us. Father, we pray that you give us power, the capacity to love, the ability to forgive. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The scripture says the entrance of your word brings light. It brings us understanding to the simple. Father, let your word that we are about to listen to, let it illuminate our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we don't want to be the hearers of the word alone, but the doer thereof. Father, the ability to hear and to do according to your word be given unto us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father, for answer prayer. You, for in Jesus' name we pray. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you are glad to be in church this morning, jam your hands together for Jesus. God bless you, choir. You may have your seat. Let's be seated. Good morning, church. I want you to... Today is the first Sunday in the month of June, and it's our Thanksgiving service. Everybody is looking gorgeous. I want you to welcome someone to church this morning. Just welcome someone to church. Tell that person that he or she is looking good. Mm. You are looking handsome. You are looking beautiful. Praise the Lord. Some people are not putting on a smile at all. Amen. Praise the Lord. For the next, for the next two weeks, I'll be sharing with you on my message series on forgiveness, on forgiveness, forgiveness. So today I title my message, Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace, Can you bring it down? Amazing Grace. My text this morning is in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Romans Chapter 8 and verse 1. 
So if you have your Bibles with you, it is time for you to bring them out. Bring them out of the bag. So you need to read with, along with me. Maybe you need to underline some words so that you can always read over later in the day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is a known fact that anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness does not only affect the individual, it also affects those people around them. Anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness does not only affect the individual, but also affect other people that are in touch with that person. You will realize as a believer, over the years, anytime you have a form of displeasure or you have a grudge in your heart, you discover that you are withdrawn and you want every other person around you to feel pity for you. You want them to be in the same mood with you. But if you discover for one reason or the other, they, don't, they are not sensitive to your mood. It aggravates you the more. It aggravates you the more. So what is anger? What is anger? Technical sound comes sound from this, from this. What is anger? Anger is a show or a display or a feeling of displeasure. Anger is a feeling or a show of one's displeasure towards another or an event. Anger doesn't last long. Most of the time, anger doesn't last long. However, there is another one that we call bitterness. Bitterness is when you allow your anger to be sustained for a period of time. When you allow your anger to be sustained over a period of time or an unresolved anger, it degenerates to hatred and resentment towards another and bitterness normally takes long so when you are bitter your bitterness will drive you into hatred and resentment towards another or an event praise the lord praise the lord when you are full of anger or bitterness, it will always reflect in your mood. It will always reflect in your attitude. It will reflect in your actions towards the other. You are always full of negativity. When you are full of anger or bitterness, you are always full of negativity. Even the word that you speak, the word that comes out of your mouth is hurtful to the other. It is always hurtful to the other. When you allow your anger to be full grown in your heart, it drives you to evil. When your anger becomes full grown in your heart towards the other person, it drives you to evil. Evil thoughts towards your family, your relative, your sibling, your friend. When your anger has grown in your heart. Unresolved anger. Unresolved anger We always entangle you. Unresolved anger We always entangle you. It does not only entangle you, it will also defile the other person. It will also defile the other person who is around you. So what does the Bible say about anger? What does the scripture say about anger? I want you to turn your Bible with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians. Chapter 4. The book of Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 26 and 27. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 26 and 27. 
Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus. And it reads, Be angry. Be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. It means don't let the sun go down on your anger. Nor give place to the devil. It's a command. It says, be angry. He it said, it's okay to be angry. It's a command. It is a present active imperative word. Be angry. The next word, the next line after it, it says, do not sin. It's also a command. Do not sin. Means that be angry or do not sin. I want to quickly share four foundational, foundational principles from these two verses. Let me share four foundational principles from these two verses. The first one says, be angry, be angry. It means that anger itself is a godly emotion. Anger itself is a godly emotion. It is okay for you to be angry. Tell your neighbor, it's okay to be angry. It is okay to be angry. Your angers only helps you draw a red line between you and the other. You see, without your anger, people will dump stuff on you. Your anger simply means you are expressing your displeasure. Your anger is only telling other people that you don't like what they are doing. It's a feeling. It doesn't last long. If you don't display anger, you see people will take you, people will assume that everything they do to you is okay. They will cross your line. They will cross the boundary. It is okay to be angry. We are created in the image and the likeness of God. Our God is a God of justice. He's a God of justice. In the Garden of Eden, when man sinned against God, God began to met out punishment. And the punishment against our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience to God was death. That was it. When Sodom and Gomorrah, when they sinned before God, God came down and destroyed. Our God is a God of justice. That's why the scripture says, I am a consuming fire. If God says I'm a consuming, and a jealous God, it's okay to be jealous also. It is an attribute of God that you are jealous. That you are angry is also an attribute of God. There is wrath in God and there is mercy in God. There is love in God and there is justice. Our God is a God of justice. So it's okay. You can be angry as many times you want to. As many times you want to be angry, it's okay. There is no limit to the number of times you should display your emotion when it comes to your own displeasure. Praise the Lord. But the next line says, do not sin. Aha. Uh -huh. It means that there is an anger that will lead you to sin. You should be angry. Anger itself is a godly emotion. However, an all resolved anger, there are some anger that are not controlled. It will lead you into sin. Anger that is not controlled will lead you into sin. Don't express your anger sinfully. Let me put it that way. Don't express your anger towards another in a sinful way. It is okay for you to be angry, but don't let it become sinful in your life. Praise the Lord. Number three, he says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. The word wrath there means your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. We can look at this in a figurative way or in a literary meaning. But I will choose to look at it in a, from a literary, literary uh, point of view. He says, don't let the sun go down. Meaning that don't let your anger stay for too long. Don't let it stay for too long. You see, when we say too long, being too long can be relative. What is long for me may be short to another person. Three days may be too long for another person. One month 
may just be adequate for another person. But if we are to follow the scripture, he said, don't let the sun go down. The sun going down means that we have 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It means that no matter what someone has done to you, the wrong somebody has done to you, make sure before 6 p.m., let it go. Resolve it. Call that person. Tell the person. Talk to that person. Let the person talk it over. Let the person apologize to you. And let it go. Let it go. Don't sustain your anger. Don't keep your anger. When you keep your anger, it will become bitterness in your heart. Your own resolve anger will become bitterness in your heart. And bitterness leads you to evil. Number four. That is verse 27. He says, nor give place to the devil. Nor give place to the devil. It means that when you allow your anger to be sustained for too long, when you allow your anger to be sustained for too long, it becomes a sin, it becomes sinful in your life and the, you allow the devil to have a foothold on you. Once you allow your anger to become sin in your life, it will give the devil a foothold in your life. So what Paul is trying to say to you, it is okay for you to be angry. Make sure you resolve the anger quickly. If you don't resolve that anger quickly, it will become a sin. And when it becomes a sin, the devil will take hold of you. I pray the devil will not take a hold of you in the name of Jesus. So as a believer, it is okay for us to develop, to pursue a godly attitude. A godly attitude and actions towards the other. It is okay for you. It is okay for me. For us. To develop and pursue a godly attitude towards another. To have a heart of kindness. To develop a heart of kindness. To have a heart of a tender hearted heart. To have a tender hearted heart of forgiveness for other. Learn to forgive another. Learn to forgive another and show love to the other. That is what God wants us to do. And that is who we are. I say that is who you are. I say that is who you are. In the name of Jesus. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians 4 verse 31. 4 31. Don't flip down to verse 31. He says, Let all bitterness Rats, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. And evil speaking be put away far from you with all malice. Let bitterness, wrath, which is your anger, your clamor, evil speaking, let it be put away. As a child of God, if you are in a congregation of people, you are in a garden of people, and you are having a discussion or a conversation about someone else, you should ask yourself, this discussion that we are having, if that person should come in, are we, be, are we able to continue that discussion? If you cannot continue that discussion, it is evil speaking. It is ungodly. It is ungodly. When somebody calls you, I want to give you a gist as it hurts. I want to give you a gist. But don't tell that person that I said so. It is ungodly. It is evil speaking. As a woman, as a man, don't engage in any discussion that the other person cannot hear. Once that person cannot hear, I didn't say so. It, the scripture say it is evil speaking. You are gossiping. Don't gossip about the other person. If that person cannot hear it, then you should not hear it. If somebody is coming to tell you something that the person cannot hear, then that person should not tell you. Let that person keep the gist. Let that person keep the discussion. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That is why the book of Psalm, verse, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the man, both man and woman, Blessed is the man that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. 
or stand in the way of the sinner or sit in the seat of the scornful. For his delight shall be in the law of the Lord and in it shall he meditate day and night. In the law of the Lord will he meditate day and night. If you must gossip, gossip about the scripture. That is what he's saying. If you want to gossip, gossip about the scripture. Call somebody and discuss the scripture, what you have studied in the Bible with the person. This is what you should talk about. Don't talk about someone behind the person that that person cannot hear about. It is evil speaking. Praise the Lord. I see people who are getting cold this morning. Amen. Amen. An uncontrolled anger will rob you of your happiness and your freedom. An uncontrolled anger, it will rob you of your happiness and your freedom. Sometimes just for you to show to your relative, to your colleague, to your friends, your deepest emotion when it comes to your displeasure, Sometimes we become withdrawn. We get withdrawn. We want everybody around us to know that we are not feeling okay. We want them to come and apologize to us. Let me tell you this quickly this morning. Do you know sometimes when somebody has done something wrong to you, the person may not know that he has wronged you. The person may not know that he has done something wrong to you. And you will hold the wrong. The heart will be within you. You will keep it for one day. Rather than calling that person to discuss it over with that person, you will tell it to another person. This person that has wronged you has gone away. He's now enjoying his life. He doesn't even remember that he has hurt you. But one week, two weeks after, you are still hurt. Because you expect that person to come back and, and apologize to you. But this person can't even remember he or she hurts you. The day you pick your phone to tell this person that you have hurt me, the person cannot even remember. The person cannot even remember. Why is it that somebody has done wrong to you? You can't pick your phone or call that person immediately and say, my sister, you said something and I don't like it. Don't keep the wrong of people in your heart. Don't store it over. It hurts you. It doesn't hurt that person. It hurts you. That hurt is going to rob you of your own freedom. It's going to rob you of your own happiness. You will discover for as long as you are hurt, you are unhappy. You, remain, you cannot sleep because somebody has hurt you. Call the sister. Call your brother. Let the person know what he or she has done wrong. Sometimes there are some things that we do that we should be able to overlook. Some things happened, somebody has hurt you. There are things that we can easily overlook. There was a story I had of a couple in a state of Texas in America. This couple, they had an argument and the man took a saw. A saw is that um, blade that um, the carpenter uses. And he cut the house they are living into two. He saw the house into two half. He pulled one part of the house to one side. He pulled the other one to the other side. The wife was living on one half of the house. The husband was living in the other half of the house. And for 40 years, they were living on the same Compound, in the same compound and they didn't speak a word to one another for 40 years what is the cause of it the woman spent small money to buy sugar 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 was the reason for their separation sugar was the reason for the anger there are some things that we should let go as a child of God let it go Somebody said something. Let it go. Let it go. For you to have a successful marriage, to have a successful marriage relationship, 
One of those things that you must cultivate is the act of forgiveness towards your spouse. If you want to last long in that marriage, you must have a heart of forgiveness, a continued, not just once, a continued heart of forgiveness towards your spouse. As a man, you must be able to take the wrong, even though you are right. You are the one that is right. You must be the one to say sorry first. You will say, but the wife will think that I am weak. It is not the show of weakness. Rather, it is show of maturity and strength. It is a show of maturity and strength. Let me tell you this. When it, there is an argument between you and your husband, both of you, the same issue, if they call you to come and explain it, both of you will give different interpretations. There is no win or winner or loser when it comes to argument. Everybody is right. So when there is something that comes up in between the two of you, somebody must be able to come down and accept the blame. You see, that is why the scripture says, love your own wife. The scripture said to the husband, love your own wife. You see, this love God says we should love our wife, it is not a filial love. It is not an, it's not an eros love. It is an agape love, a God kind of love. How did God love us? God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, and he died for us. That is how he loved us. As a husband, you should die for your wife. So when there is a discussion and an argument, die for her. Take the strife for her. Take the strife for her. Take the strife for your wife. Allow the situation to calm down. Let it douse, douse the tension. When the whole thing is calm, you see the woman is now ready to hear you. If you now call her later and say, you know what you did earlier was wrong, she will tell you, I am sorry. But when the whole thing is hot and you are trying to explain to her, she can't hear you. She can't hear you. She wants you to hear her also. She is on fire. You too, you are on fire. You are not right. What you are saying doesn't make sense. To both of you, it doesn't make sense. Praise the Lord. That leads me to forgiveness. Forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness means mercy. Forgiveness means to pardon. To forgive means remission. It means remission. Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins. He shed his blood for our own forgiveness. That is what forgiveness is. Let me say this to you. It is always difficult to forgive. See, forgiveness is not something you want to do. It is very difficult to forgive. Not only is it difficult to forgive, even to ask the other person for forgiveness is even more difficult. To say, I am sorry, is one of the difficult statements anybody can make. That three word, I am sorry, is not in the dictionary of some people, even as a believer. To say, I am sorry, even when you know that you are the one that is wrong. To say, I am sorry. We feel that when you say, I am sorry, the person will feel that you are weak. You think that the person will take you for granted. I am sorry. We go a long way to heal wounds. As a believer, learn to say, I am sorry. Open your mouth and say, I am sorry. When you know that you are wrong, don't try to justify your wrong. Don't try to justify your wrong. Open your mouth and say sorry to that person. You see, forgiveness is not natural. Forgiveness is not natural. What is natural is revenge. What is natural is to retaliate. 
you will discover that when somebody has hurt you, you are looking for that opportunity to retaliate. In fact, you want the person to suffer the pain, the same pain that he has put you through. You want that person to suffer hell here on earth. Just for you to prove, to show to that person that what you did was wrong. Next time, don't do it again. We always want to retaliate. We want to take a pound of flesh. A tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. I will show you. That is who we are. That is who we are. We always think that our unforgiveness sometimes will help promote the suffering of the other person. You think that when you live in unforgiveness, that other person will suffer. Let me say this to you. It is you that is harboring the unforgiveness that is suffering. You are the one that is suffering. Maybe the person is supposed to help you. The person cannot help you. You are suffering. As long as you decide not to forgive, you are, you are suffering. You remain in your suffering. Let it go. Every heart, in every way, somebody has done wrong to you. Let it go. The scripture says, a merry heart. He said, it dwells good like medicine. A merry heart. That is why some people are looking too old. Older than your age. You are 25, you are looking 45. When you frown too much, all your muscles that are supposed to make you young, they are growing old. You are in bitterness. Let it go. Don't remain in your suffering. So the question this morning is, so how do I go about forgiving others? How do I go about forgiving others? How can I forgive people? You see, the process of forgiving people is a difficult process. Once you have started the process, it makes you to become like Christ. You are now Christ-like. You are now Christ-like. Once you start the process of forgiveness, it makes you look like Christ. You see, forgiveness is always very painful. If you are going to forgive somebody for what they have done to you, the fact that you are going to forgive that person without punishing that person, it will pay you the more. It will always pay you the more. Because forgiveness is something you don't want to extend. You don't want to extend forgiveness. Rather, you want to extend retaliation. That is what you want to extend. Peter approached Jesus, Jesus and said, Jesus, how many times should I forgive if my brother sinned against me? Up to seven times, turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew. Open the book of Matthew. Chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 21. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. Matthew 18 and verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to him, he came to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I will forgive him. Up to seven times, there's a question mark. Up to seven times. You see, let me tell you this. According to the Jewish rabbinic law, there was a law back then. It is believed that if somebody has wronged you up to three times, you can forgive the person. After the third time, the fourth time, uh, you can choose not to forgive. So Peter thought it wise and said, if I go to Jesus and tell Jesus three times, Jesus may say, uh -uh, it's not good, make it four. So Peter, because he knew that Jesus always raised the, raised the standard. He always raises the bar. So Peter decided to add four more times to it, to make it seven. According to their law, it was three. But Peter decided to add four, thinking that Jesus will say, well done, Peter. Well done, Peter. Seven times is okay. 
But let us see how Jesus responds to Peter in verse 22. Verse 22. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. 70 times seven. If I remember my arithmetics very well, 70 times seven is 490 times. It means that it is very difficult for you to begin to record. He has offended me one, two, three, four. What Jesus is simply saying is that as many times as somebody offends you, forgive. There is no limit to the number of times you should forgive someone. Forgive as many times. Let forgiveness flow from you. Let forgiveness flow from your heart. I'm sure for Peter to hear 490 times or 70 times, 7 times, that wasn't the answer Peter wants to hear. And I'm sure that is not the kind of answer you want to hear either. You see, if you must forgive the other person, it is imperative for you to know what God did for you to be forgiven. For you to forgive, to extend forgiveness to others, it is imperative, it is important that you know what God did, what God went through to forgive you of your own sin. You need to understand the sacrifices Jesus had to make for your sake to forgive you of your sin, to forgive you of your wrongdoing. You see, God looked at you with the tenderest heart and he said to you, I forgive you. God looked at you and he said to you, I love you. I forgive you and I love you. You see, the forgiveness and the love God has shown to us, it is not something that you merit. The Bible calls it justification. You don't merit it. You, don't, you are not supposed to get it. You are not supposed to be forgiven. But God looked at you while in your sin and he said, I forgive you. Not only did he forgive you, he said, I love you with it. It's called justification. You see, that word justification or justified, it simply means to, that God looked at you just as if you never sinned. Justified. Just as if you never sinned. God looks at you as if you never sinned. That is justification. Justification is imputing righteousness on you. It's imputing righteousness, something that you don't merit, imputed on you. Justification is an instantaneous act of God in which he sees you sinless. God sees you sinless. And he now sees the righteousness of Christ in you. That is his justification. That is what it means to be justified. And we are justified through faith. It is not what you can pay for. It is by faith. The scripture says, it is by grace we are saved through faith. It is by grace. It is his amazing grace. It is the grace that God has extended to you, had extended to me, to us all, that our sins are forgiven. That is why that our text this morning, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Romans 8 chapter 1, it says, And there is therefore now, and there is therefore now, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There is no more condemnation. There is no more condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. No more condemnation. Walking according to the flesh, meaning that you are satisfying your fleshy desires. Everything that is against God is walking not walking according to the flesh. But if you walk according to the Spirit, is accepting Jesus in your heart and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to walk through you. 
renewing you from your inner man, creating a new nature on the inside of you and manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. That is why Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husband mine or the vine dresser. He says, any branch in me that doesn't bring fruit, it shall be cut off. But any branch in me that brings forth fruit, he says it shall be purged or pruned that it may bring much fruit. There is no more condemnation. Jesus has paid for all your sins. All your past sins, Jesus paid for it. All your present sins, Jesus paid for it. Even the future sin, the one you are going to commit tomorrow, Jesus paid for it. Only if you come and ask for forgiveness and you'll be forgiven. Jesus, the blood of Jesus was shed once and he has taken care of every sin that you ever commit. God forgave you. That is what Jesus did. That is why the book of Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is to the west, so far has he removed our transgression away from us. As far as the east is to the west, so far has he removed our transgression away from us. If you draw a line with an arrow facing the east and you draw another line facing the west, if you continue to go to the east and to the west, see those lines will never meet. God is saying, this, your sin has been taken away, has been cancelled completely. God does not even keep the wrong. God cannot even remember it. God cannot even remember it. God imputes Jesus' righteousness on you. That is why the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was without sin. Jesus knew no sin. God made him to be sin for us. He imputed all your sin, every sin you will ever commit. God took everything and laid it on, the, on Jesus. When Jesus was hanging on that Calvary's cross, your sins were nailed with it. You were nailed with it. You died with Jesus. That when he rose, you also raised. You rose in righteousness with Jesus. That's why the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 says, And be found in him, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, I don't have my own, you don't have your own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Remember that the law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. The law was given by Moses, grace and truth was given by Jesus. The scriptures is saying, it's very clear. He said the righteousness you have, it is not of your own. It is what you found in Jesus and is you all only receive it by faith. It is by faith that you have it. Not of your works. Not of your works. Not of your works. That is why the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all, not, not few, all, everybody, you and I, there is no righteous, not one, not one righteous. We all have sinned and fallen below the standard of God. We all have sinned. Verse 24 of that Romans 3 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Be justified freely by grace. It is by this amazing grace that we are talking about. Through the redemption that is in Jesus. The book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 and 14 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has made us to be qualified to be a partaker of the inheritance in the saints in the light. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption. 
in his blood, even to the forgiveness of sin. In whom we have redemption, in his blood, even to the forgiveness of sin. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, therefore, by the deed of the law, no man be justified. By the deed of the law, no flesh will be justified. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, the law cannot take away your sin. That you do not bow to another God that you do everything according to the scripture cannot take away your sin. Your sins are only forgiven when you have faith in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way your sins are truly and truly forgiven. The book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12 says, For I will be merciful to your unrighteousness. I will be merciful to all your unrighteousness. For your sins and your iniquities, I will remember them no more. Your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember them no more. I will remember them no more. I will be merciful. God says, I will be merciful. Not for anything that you have done. It is not your prayer. It's not for anything that you have done right. It is what God gave to you free of charge. It was given. This forgiveness was free of charge. All you did was to have faith in the finished work of Jesus. And you have it. And you are forgiven. 1 John 1.9 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive all our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Only if you can confess them. Only if you can confess them. Only if you can confess them. If this is what Jesus went through, when I imagine Jesus on the Calvary's cross, Jesus on the Calvary's cross, nailed to the cross, they pulled a ton of horns, a crown of thorn in his head, piercing through his flesh into his skull. The pain and the agony, as he began to weep, he was weeping profusely. They put nails in his hands, as the blood drips down his hands. They pierce his side as blood flows. Water flows from his side. They nailed his feet and he was suspended as he went through the pain and the agony. And he's weeping, blood gushing down over him. And he looked up to heaven and said, Father, forgive them. For I know not, they know not what they have done. Father, Forgive them for they know not what they have done. Forgiveness is always painful. Jesus demonstrated it. Forgiveness is always painful. This is the supreme act of God's grace of forgiveness. Once you have experienced the forgiveness which God gives, you will be more ready to also extend forgiveness to others. Now you know what Jesus went through to forgive you of your sin. You are now more ready to forgive others. See, Jesus said, I know what you did. I know all that you have done. But I decide to forgive you. Jesus says, I won't wait for you to come to apologize. I forgive you in advance. Jesus says this morning, I forgive you of your past sins. I forgive you of your present sin. And I have forgiven you of your future sins. Everything has been forgiven. Now you have seen. You now know what God went through to forgive you of your sin. You see the sacrifice Jesus had to pay to forgive you of your sin. 
Jesus had to die to forgive you of your sin. He died to forgive your sins. Can you also, this one is say, look unto that man who stole your property. That person that took your purse, stole your phone, took your car, stole something away from you. Can you also look at him and say, I forgive you this morning. Wife, can you look at your husband knowing what Jesus did for you to forgive you? Can you also look at your husband and say, I know what you have been doing. I know all that you have done. But I decide to forgive you. Husband, can you look at your wife also and say, I know what you have been up to lately. But despite all, I decide to forgive you. Your father was not there for you through school. He was not even there for you at all. You went through life by yourself. Your mother didn't even help the matter at all. But now you are grown up. Can you look at your parents and say to them, I forgive you. Can you tell them, I forgive you. That man was supposed to marry you. He proposed to you. Yes, that was true. But he left you for another woman. Can you look at that man and say, I forgive you. Can you just say, I forgive you. Can you say, I forgive you. I pray for you this morning that as you, as you decide to forgive, every emotional hurt they are healed in the name of Jesus. Everything that brings you hurt in your heart, that brings you pain in your heart, that draws, draws you to anger, they are healed in the name of Jesus. If you know that this word has been a blessing to you, shout a loud amen. amen. You may rise as we pray together.